Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, September 18th, and we will be hearing uh, take two of Public Art Life Cycle Part <laughs> One Concept to Commission. Uh, we had started this webcast last week, but just due to technical glitches and the universe telling us no, uh, we had to stop the recording. And so this week we are um, good to go now to, to continue on with our part one in, in our series. Um, for technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the chat box located in your webinar toolbar. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all of those who are sponsoring and who can make these webcasts possible and free to members. In particular, uh, this two-part series is sponsored by APA's Urban Design and Preservation Division. Uh, so thanks to them, you'll hear a little bit more about them and the uh, upcoming activities that they have planned here in just a few moments. Coming up next on your screen is a screenshot, actually, of our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. This is where you go to get uh, up-to-date information on all of our sessions. This is where you register for all of our sessions. You can see kind of an upcoming list. Um, of course, I didn't update. But this is part one, actually, that, that we're having here. Um, so just head over to ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast to register for all of our sessions. Uh, we do have a prior webcast tab. Here's where you go to download PDF copies of all of our previous session slides. The distance education tab here, we have several sessions available for on-demand viewing through the end of this year, a couple law, a couple ethics, and a general session. So be sure to hit that up if you need those continuing education credits. So again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits. Uh, you can head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and then search either by the title or the event number, um, both of which can be found again on our webcast webpage. So be sure to, to get those credits in. Um, and this is a law session. So uh, this, this is available for 1.5 CM law. Make sure you like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information uh, on our sessions. This is where we go if we have any immediate changes to dates or times, or when we have new webcasts that are available for you to register for. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and search Planning Webcast, and we'll pop up. We have over 300 recorded videos. We record all of our videos, including this one. Um, we have over 3,000 subscribers, so be sure to subscribe so that you get up-to-date information when our sessions do post. Um, I think that is the end of my housekeeping. I know Margaret is going to talk a little bit more um, about part two of this session, which was actually supposed to be today. It is going to be held uh, in January 2021, and I have gotten many emails from people wondering, why are we waiting so long? And that is because um, thankfully, we are booked through 2020 for all of our Fridays, and now we're booking Thursdays, Wednesdays, Tuesdays, um, and I only have so much time as a volunteer. So we are booking part two of this session in 2021, um, and that is the reason why it's not happening closer. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Margaret, who will give an introduction um, of the Urban Design and Preservation Division and kick us off. Margaret. Thanks, Chris. So yes, welcome from our division. We like to start with a uh, rec with a statement from the leadership, which is on the next slide, which concerns equity. The leadership of our division is committed to amplifying the voices of people of color in the community and in our professions and acknowledging their perspectives and contributions. We are also committed to identifying and avoiding negative bias and discerning and opposing inequitable policies, plans, and laws. I'd like to uh, announce some of the upcoming activities for our members. We have a virtual open house, our first ever 
scheduled to begin on the 21st. And we welcome you to join the division and join us at our virtual open house. This is a new and creative version of what would otherwise be called an annual meeting. Our book discussion will be October 5th on the how historic preservation is reviving America's communities. So be sure to sign up for that. Our next webinar will be coming up in October. It's about shared streets and flush streets by the national experts on this at Tool Design. Then we have Urban Landscape Framework and Historic Preservation with the highly regarded and well-known Donovan Ripkema and Brianna Grosicki. This will be a video presentation by international experts in this area attached to a live Q&A. Then in March, we've got Legacy Business Initiatives with Elizabeth Morton. This concerns how we safeguard and nurture the small businesses in our communities, which not only serve the economy, but add to the character and the sense of community that we all experience. And she will be presenting with two panelists on efforts that have been made in other jurisdictions to protect these legacy businesses. That being said, I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Sarah Conley Odenkirk. This series called Rules, Rebels, and Riots. Today will be part one, Concept Commission. Sarah has practiced law in the area of fine art for more than 20 years. She advises clients on matters related to the arts in both the public and the private sector. And through her years of practice, she's developed a deep understanding of public art and cultural policy. She uses this experience to provide legal service and also strategic planning guidance through a legal lens, which is how she is going to be describing the public art life cycle today. Her practice supports innovative programs and the evolution of balanced and sustainable cultural ecosystems. At the same time that she maintained her legal practice, Sarah was the associate director of the art business and arts management program at Claremont University where she taught from 2013 to 2017. She's very involved with the art community and has maintained memberships on a number of committees and boards throughout her career. So your paths may have crossed already. And she has also served as president of the Public Art Network. With that, I'm delighted to introduce to you Sarah Conley Odenkirk. Thank you, Margaret. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I am delighted to be doing this again and um, hopefully we'll have no more technical issues this this time um i want to make sure it looks like it is showing up it's beautiful <laughs> excellent all right well let's get started then so last week i used my joke already about misunderstanding the time scheduled for the webinar um, so i'm gonna skip my big joke and just move right into the meat of what we have to talk about uh, because we do have a lot to cover if at any point I'm moving too fast, please let Christine know and I will uh, do my best to slow down. The topic of um, public art, the public art life cycle, which is today's conversation, um, is a really big one and there's definitely a lot to cover depending on how deeply we're going to dive into the topic. This, it's for today, we really only have time to stay pretty much on the surface. Um, and um, but but we will have questions at the end so please feel free to jot down your questions and um, put them into the I, I believe Christine already mentioned the chat box and then we can uh, deal with that at the end um, I'd also encourage you now to sign up for the second part of this conversation and I know that it seems like it's a long distance away because it's going to be in January 
Um, but uh, it is going to be exciting. And I think between now and January, actually, we're going to have some more um, timely things to talk about with regard to public art, given that we've got a fairly active political um, uh, world right now. And the next six months will inevitably bring some more challenges and controversies that we can address in January. So today I'm going to start off with a brief framework, uh, and from that we can springboard into a media conversation about the process of commissioning public art and the challenges that can arise along the way. Um, this framework is really important because if it's taken for granted that everybody understands public art in the same way, we really risk assumptions that could be fatal in protecting public art programs. And as you'll, I'm sure, gather from my presentation, I'm a huge advocate of public art programs, both in the public sector and in the private sector. I was recently speaking with a public art colleague who was faced with the possible defunding of her entire public art program. And actually, I meant to follow up with her this week to see where that is. Hopefully, there's been some positive um, uh, progression of that conversation. But in the meantime, this decision was made in about five minutes at the end of the council meeting without any discussion or debate. And I have to believe that the council members were doing something that they thought made sense and was warranted given the economic and social pressures facing communities across the country. I also have to believe that they made this hasty and in my view, tragic decision without truly understanding what public art is and the crucial role that it plays in our communities. Hopefully my colleague will have another bite of the apple, but unfortunately there are a lot of these kinds of conversations happening across the country right now. Uh, when, uh, at a time really when creative interventions have shown themselves already to be crucial um, as, as part of our, um, our efforts to look at systemic change, uh, racial and social um, justice, and improving the communication pathways that we all recognize need to be better. So really art is essential in these community considerations. And we have to be able to quickly and directly communicate what public art is and why its presence in our community is critical, especially during challenging, challenging times like the one we are experiencing now. All right, so public art. Traditionally, it's visual art that we think of. Things like traditional sculptures in plazas and parks. Um, you may have also heard this referred to as plop art. Um, and of course, visual art is also going to include potentially monuments. But we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the second part of the series uh, in terms of how monuments are or are not um, defined as artworks and what that means from a policy perspective. Uh, if artwork is integrated into buildings or construction, sometimes questions arise as to where the line between artwork ends and design and landscaping begins. Uh, so we can talk about that a little bit as well. Murals and other installations can be considered and are treated as permanent or temporary works depending on the intentions, the budget, and the materials used. And then other temporary works may be, uh, for instance, borrowed from other institutions, collectors, or even from artists for temporary installations. And we're seeing a lot more of that happening, uh, both for cost purposes as well as for um, uh, purposes of trying to include more diversity in rotating exhibitions. Temporary work might also simply be made with more fugitive materials, meaning fragile materials, not illegal ones. Uh, and these are not necessarily intended to endure over time. So the intention of the work is a temporary but visual presentation. And then there are time-based works, which refer to works that unfold over time, of course, um, often refers to video or projection work, which can also cross into the experiential category. Um, but might encompass things like billboards, billboard projects, um, which may, many of you may have seen. There have been a number of um, large billboard initiatives that have unrolled over the last few years uh, and gained quite a bit of attention. Public art can also mean performance. Um, of course, I'm sure we've all come across um, impromptu performances or official performances in public spaces. Uh, so this could include things like dance, theatrical performances, and of course, literary or spoken word performances. Experiential um, is something that uh, we're seeing more and more of, and it relies perhaps the most on technology and can include things like digital presentations. Here we see a, a, an image of um, a, a light festival that happens in Sydney on the Opera House every year. 
Um, and this takes advantage of projection mapping, uh, which has gained a lot of attention, uh, both from the standpoint of being sort of a subversive, uh, quick to put together kind of projection that can be uh, part of a protest or something larger and um, more spectacular, um, such as the one pictured here. Sound experiences can also be interactive um, when the visual cues are provided or manipulated by the audience sometimes, and then translated um, into sound, or there are passive experiences where the audience is bathed in sound as they travel through a location. Uh, immersive experiences of any sort are considered to be experiential, and of course, what comes to mind um, for, for many is things like um, the pop-up museum of ice cream, or um, venues like Meow Wolf. Social engagement is something that is also um, a, a popular area of conversation and discourse right now, um, and can include uh, also participatory and interactive exhibitions. But for instance, you see up here, um, this Before I Die project examines the ways that walls in our cities can help grapple with death and meaning as a community. Um, this was put up by artist Cindy Chang originally, although it's been knocked off many, many times for all sorts of other uh, beginning sentences asking for people to uh, finish them. Um, so here she covered a crumbling house in her neighborhood in New Orleans with this mural, Before I Die, I Want To, and then people came and filled that in. Um, this was definitely a way of interacting with the community and uh, bringing people together. Um, though obviously we are in a, a situation right now where we have to be very careful about putting public art in um, spaces where we are encouraging people to gather in large groups. One of my favorites that unfortunately can't happen right now either are um, large community meals, which are, um, I know for some it's, it's a stretch to consider that public art, um, but there are a number of artists who are working with that community meal um, uh, context to bring um, bring more notice to things like food deserts and um, the inequities in food availability in different communities, um, as well as for uh, environmental causes. Then we have land or earthworks. Um, many of you have, I'm sure, seen these along the way. It's a, a great way of having some cultural tourism, but um, of course, uh, the spiral jetty in particular is something that uh, not only is an incredibly interesting and um, uh, important work of conceptual and physical art, uh, but also is very uh, indicative of what's going on with our climate as things change around the visibility or not of um, this particular work. Um, this is a, certainly an area where there's debate generated over whether these are in fact works of art or simply landscape or design elements. Um, and, and of course, this is more clearly uh, a consideration when we're talking about things like water elements in park design. And then finally, um, the question of architecture, which I'm sure is, is a, an important consideration for everyone here today. Um, architecture is one of those gray areas, of course, where there are certainly some buildings that are in and of themselves so unique that they could be considered works of art. But different communities will address this differently uh, in terms of how they define architecture and art as being related or separate um, within their policies and potentially ordinances as well. Um, and of course, the question of whether architects are artists for purposes of justifying expenditure of public art funds will reliably be the catalyst for uh, community meeting scuffles. So um, an interesting uh, area, of course, to be up on. Okay, so where does public art come from? Once we have the basic understanding of what public art is and is not, um, and the potential definition, uh, definitional challenges lie, um, it's definitely time to focus on where public art actually comes from. How does it go from concept to, certainly in this case, concrete, literally here for this giant pictured? Um, and of course, this wouldn't be a presentation by a lawyer unless the answer to at least one of the questions was, it depends. So first let's distinguish between unsanctioned and sanctioned work because while all art ultimately comes from artists um, or, or artists of some sort, um, the appearance of artwork in the public sphere can happen with or without permission and that distinction certainly impacts how it's treated and what rules apply. 
So unsanctioned work, uh, not surprisingly, is going to include graffiti or street art. Um, and then there are also other types of uh, unsanctioned interventions that we can come across. And sometimes those are the things that just brighten our day um, and or cause a huge headache for uh, the people running public works. Street art um, can cover up boarded businesses, and, and what we're seeing now is a lot of this sort of um, unsanctioned but also sanctioned types of work happening with so many business closures and um, fears of public unrest. So um, maybe the small silver lining to some of the challenging things that we're seeing right now um, has been this just explosion of really interesting um, street art. And in some communities, there are uh, conversations happening about how cities will or will not collect this and how it's archived and how it is um, preserved for, um, for future um, historical purposes. Okay, um, here is another example um, of an intervention. And this is something that we see as being well-intentioned perhaps, but Really, when it comes to the way that artwork is supposed to be treated and oftentimes the contracts that artists have with um, the commissioning bodies, this kind of in intervention without the artist's permission is something that uh, is probably not appropriate and could be um, in violation of uh, various contract provisions as well as uh, the Visual Artist Rights Act, uh, which is a federal law. And so while well-intentioned perhaps with the message, um, it may open up a can of worms from a liability standpoint, and so should certainly be approached carefully. A couple of years ago, uh, many of you may have seen this, uh, stories around this artwork. Um, Fearless Girl was added in front of the Wall Street Charging Bull as a commentary. Initially, this was presented as a feminist statement, uh, but the message was later somewhat undercut when it was discovered that the work was commissioned by corporate interests, although I think um, uh, in hindsight, we can see that, that regardless of who funded it, there actually was, uh, was a result that came from that, but there was some awareness brought to the issue of uh, the role of women in corporate structures. So there, you know, there we go into the debate of who's paying for things. Um, this, of course, raises a very juicy and hairy question around corporate money supporting artistic endeavors at every level. Um, Nevertheless, this was an unsanctioned work. What's interesting to know is that the bull was also originally unsanctioned, um, but then became a sanctioned work um, and uh, was adopted as the, you know, in its current iconic status. So what's interesting to note here is that, of course, these works likely wouldn't have happened if they had had to go through proper channels. Um, and they, along with many of the millions of other artist interventions that happen every year, do have an impact on our communities. Um, they're kind of a raw window potentially into the ethos of a moment and can sometimes provide a more accurate representation of popular will than any other communication tool. In this way, we can truly see the power of art to speak loudly and cut through the noise of bureaucratic processes. That said, it's often a fine line and unsanctioned works can veer into the land of trespass, defacement, or destruction of property, as well as hate speech, which really brings up one of the more difficult challenges that um, uh, communities face in trying to allow speech that they feel good about and not allowing other kinds of speech. It really does raise some um, uh, very complicated issues. And so um, it's not all charming rebellion and becomes difficult to manage from a government perspective uh, when the content of the message, and that's really what the First Amendment goes to is um, uh, regulating the content or not being able to regulate the content of the message. And that's really at the heart of the controversy. We'll address that more in January. All right, sanctioned work um, would be work that comes through public works and, um, and certainly also private development. Um, and while often criticized for being less interesting, it also has the potential to be quite powerful and attract the attention of the public. So while perhaps not carrying the subversive punch that unsanctioned works can, um, it, when it's successful, public art installations can become iconic symbols of neighborhoods, cities, or even regions. And here are a few examples that um, I, uh, I'm presenting today, but there are many more. 
Um, and, and frankly, most people don't have much interest in understanding about the public art process, so it would be hard pressed to distinguish between sanctioned versus unsanctioned art. Um, mostly it's about what they like versus what they don't like. Uh, so differentiating the impact and management of the public art landscape really presents more of an issue for those working within the field to navigate as opposed to um, uh, educating the public about that, though that's always a good thing to do, of course, as well. Um, the trick is to balance the layers of rules versus the strong desire for expression and artistic intervention. And in order to do this, we do need to consider why public art is important in our communities. So the pros of public art um, are listed here. And though I'm generally opposed to wordy slides, um, on this slide I've listed out some pros and cons of public art. Um, there are, of course, more, um, but these are some of the big ones. Uh, we've got uh, enriches our lives, creates community, reduces crime, increasing tourism, mitigating development, um, and a means for acknowledging sacrifice and contribution. So policymakers, artists, consultants, and advocates really need to be ready to talk without having to hem and haw about why public art is important. Um, and um, these factors can really um, assist in understanding the pros and cons and what the arguments are to be made in favor of financially and politically supporting public art programs and projects. The cons um, also, of course, need to be considered and taken into, cons taken into consideration in terms of um, how we um, put together our arguments in favor of public art. Um, but also, it's a very important side of the conversation to understand in order to hopefully um, reposition public art depending on what the conversations are um, and the needs of, of every community is. So in an effort um, to balance the pros and cons, um, we will go through the cons now as well. So we've got encourages gentrification, which is of course a big question, um, especially when it comes to issues around affordable housing and um, the fact that for many communities, affordable housing is a huge issue. We've got a tremendous homeless problem around the country, especially in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, we, we also need to be careful about um, the racial justice issues and equity concerns that come through uh, the gentrification of neighborhoods, and art is often very closely tied to that. Um, so these are really not easy questions to, to deal with. However, it's always advisable to be aware of and consider these issues proactively rather than hoping for the best and then being on the defensive when they come up. Um, potential eyesores, if not maintained, um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next part of this series uh, when we discuss maintenance, um, but certainly paying attention to needs of maintenance for public art is important um, up front instead of waiting until it's falling apart and we don't have any money to pay for it. Um, the cost to taxpayers for maintenance, of course, is tied to that. And as we've seen with um, the uh, Confederate uh, statues in particular, but this happens around other artworks as well, they can often be a lightning rod for controversy, which can be good, but also quite bad and destructive. Um, public art can also create um, uh, a complex uh, process for government, which some people uh, object to. Uh, and developers might argue that it increases housing costs, although I have to say I have not yet met a developer who's not charging the maximum amount already. So I think in the end, the problem is that it's opening the door to more regulations on development that developers are not so enthusiastic about. But that said, um, there are developers who are quite open and, um, and, and supportive of um, including more arts within their developments as well. And that's something to encourage in communities and um, work to create more of a coalition to bring those people on board so that we've got a uh, well-rounded group of people coming to um, the legislation process to advocate for public art. Okay, um, so ultimately questions within the political and government arena boil down to whether public art programs and public art pieces are on balance successful. And if we were doing this in person, you would see my very exaggerated air quotes around successful. Um, so let's take a look at how we know uh, when public art is successful. Obviously, this is highly dependent on what criteria one uses to determine success. And we'll go through a couple of those. Um, traditionally, we would focus our, our attention on markers like critical acclaim, 
reviews, articles, critics considering work successful in public forums and publications. Um, the image here is uh, Spencer Finch's The River That Flows Both Ways, which was part of the um, neighborhood revitalization project called the High Line in New York City. If any of you have had a chance to take a walk along that um, area, it was um, privately funded, um, but uh, really has been a, a place for very interesting um, and rotating public art. Another factor in determining success would be public response, um, which can vary dramatically from place to place. This Seward Johnson sculpture of Marilyn Monroe was not at all popular in Chicago and was repeatedly vandalized and mocked, um, but it was subsequently moved to a temporary location in Palm Springs where it was so popular that after it did a little tour of um, a couple of other cities, it was returned to Palm Springs where it is now a permanent and very beloved fixture. So that public response really can uh, be a variable that changes from community to community. Financial success is something that, of course, um, especially people who are not uh, necessarily supportive of the arts in general are looking to, toward and may respond to. Um, but it's always a tricky situation determining the financial success of public art installations. Uh, it's hard to oftentimes boil that down into hard numbers that you can show come directly from that art. But um, a, a number of places have uh, been very successful in that regard. Uh, here we've got a picture of um, Christo and Jean-Claude Gates that were in Central Park in 2005. And New York City's mayor's office published a detailed report on um, an estimated $254 million in economic activity that resulted from the Gates. And this, this is important because what we see is we see um, the government uh, structure looking to that financial success. And that is definitely a way to ensure that there's going to be um, funding or at least enthusiasm for funding um, for future projects as well, although they can't all be as exciting as the gates. Finally, in the category of traditional success criteria, we can look at the value of the actual artwork purchased and whether it has increased in value. Um, in 2002, this artwork by Robert Indiana was purchased by the Scottsdale Public Art Program for $250,000. It's, a, I believe, a sculpture that is one of nine. Um, one was sold in 2007 for over $3 million, and then another one was sold <clears throat> in 2014 for over $4 million. So you can see that um, if, uh, if people are needing to defend the value of their art collection, this was a good buy for the Scottsdale Public Art Program. Um, an increase in value can potentially be problematic if the work was purchased pursuant to a public art in private development requirement, though. Um, and that's something else that we can address a little bit um, in the, the next part of this series. Uh, we are going to talk about things here, too. I'm not just pushing everything to the next, uh, the next part of this uh, conversation, but um, we will have to look a little bit more at the deaccessioning of the artworks in order to get into that issue and what that means for the public. Um, there were a couple of artworks here in Los Angeles that were sold uh, in the last two years that had gained tremendous value over the course of time. And the question really becomes um, whether uh, the benefit by the developer is appropriate or whether sculpture that has been in the public and has become uh, something that people are used to seeing and enjoy seeing should in fact remain in the public. And, and we can take a look at some of the um, cultural policies in Europe, I think, for some inspiration on how that might be addressed. Now, however, um, I think that we can safely add the important criteria of whether artwork is representative or meaningful to a community. And while this could be considered a subcategory of public response, it's a little bit more nuanced, and this consideration needs to be one that's more proactive when the art is originally cited and vetted for commissioning. Though it's important to consider the ramifications of only having Latinx art in a Latinx neighborhood, or art by a black artist in black neighborhoods and so on, being aware of how artwork is received by a community based on historical meaning, past and current inequities, and develop, um, community development plans is really important in shifting the way that public art programs commission artwork. So there is a healthy conversation to be had around the importance of um, cross-pollinating neighborhood art installations and ensuring that even in this digital age, we have a more analog way of sharing different cultures and aesthetics and making different styles and traditions more familiar 
throughout um, a community through public art, and that this is actually a very effective way of breaking down barriers and improving community relationships. Another newer criteria uh, that's brought to the mix is uh, the effectiveness of public art to signal inclusiveness um, for those who previously may not have been included. Uh, Yinka Shonibara's sculpture at the entrance to Central Park is beautiful, but also provides a symbol of welcome to all cultures at a moment when we're having to address the frankly somewhat surprising controversies around removing sculptures welcoming only whites into parks and public spaces. Obviously, uh, public art is not a panacea for all past injuries, but it definitely can provide a step in the right direction, um, as well as being a work that also receives public accolades and critical acclaim. I've laid these criteria for determining success. I've, I've laid these out before talking about how work is commissioned, because I think it's important for those working in the public art ecosystem to approach all projects, legislation, and advocacy from the standpoint of putting questions like, the good of the community and the needs of the community first. Um, this is why I find the field of public art so much more invigorating than purely focusing on the high end of the art market. Um, but of course, this still begs the question of who pays for public art? The answer is not necessarily all that simple. Public art may be funded with public or private money. Public art may be purchased by a private party and donated to a public body. Uh, or it may be purchased or commissioned by a nonprofit arts agency or museum. But most frequently, public art is instigated, at least at some level, through the government. Percent for art programs exist at the federal, state, and local levels, affecting both public and private development. Percent for art programs that are government sponsored use a portion or percentage of money allocated to the construction of public facilities for the purchase or commission of artwork accessible to the public. At this point, there are well over 350 of these programs nationwide. The percent for art programs at the federal level are run through the General Services Administration, or GSA, offices uh, which are set up regionally around the country, and there are 11 regions in all. State public art programs may be run through redevelopment agencies or departments of cultural affairs. And then there are also the quasi-governmental entities like airports or other transportation hubs that often have their own departments and procedures as well for commissioning and installing public art. Municipalities' public art requirements and their implementation vary widely. Some have official public art offices or the selection and commissioning process may be run through personnel in another department like the Department for Cultural Affairs or building or zoning, community services, and sometimes even parks and recreation. Uh, some communities find it more efficient to have outside nonprofit organizations manage their public art process um, through partnership arrangements with the appropriate city agency. Uh, and that introduces some interesting different layers uh, in terms of the contracts that need to be put together uh, between the government agency and that outside nonprofit. Cities like Pittsburgh have been very successful with this model um, as well as uh, Portland, Oregon. There are also many percent for art programs that apply to private development, uh, usually with regard to commercial and or mixed use buildings, but sometimes residential as well. Currently, there are more than 90 communities around the country that have such a public art for private development requirement. And these programs range from completely voluntary programs run by one person who's available through the municipality to offer assistance to developers. Um, when, uh, when there is a desire to integrate a project uh, to mandatory and highly regulated programs employing multiple employees on a full-time basis. So you really, those, these programs really run the gamut. Um, I actually maintain a database that you can access and subscribe to through my website, artconvergecommunity.com, and that contains program summaries for all of the programs uh, that I've been able to pull together at this point, um, as well as the underlying or related documents which we're going to get into a little bit here, uh, things like uh, public art master plans and uh, developer guides. The public art in private development programs are relatively new um, in the field of public art, but they do have the potential for being a staple in the development of public art, um, because while, as I mentioned before, developers often view public art requirements as an additional tax on their ability to develop, the more enlightened in the bunch see instead the potential for community engagement 
and a way to give back to a community that's going to support whatever development is going in. Plans to pursue public art projects may be spontaneous and unique, or they may be initiated pursuant to a master plan. Uh, master plans can be prepared for an entire city or a small area within the city. For instance, there could be a master plan in place for waterfront development or for an industrial area uh, or any other area specifically identified as an area in which a municipality wishes to have a plan for development. A public art master plan may be prepared by someone working within the municipality or by an outside consultant. Often it does make sense to engage an outside consultant as that person will not have any of the potential baggage um, that a community member might, uh, thus enabling the consultant to produce a plan that's more objective and see potential community assets through new eyes, which we can all, always, almost always use. Um, that being said, emotional considerations certainly play a role in the development of a master plan. So the dreams and desires of a community will no doubt inform the way that art is received and treated. And thus a crucial aspect of a consultant's job will be to engage with the community to get a true sense of what matters to, to that community before putting together um, that master plan. A master plan will address the specific conditions of the geographic area in consideration. And this may include evaluating sites within that area and their appropriateness for hosting artwork. Um, the master plan will also look at communities to determine the type of work that might be appropriate to commission and the processes that should be put in place to do so. Such a plan might also assist in designing strategies for establishing partnerships with specific artists who may be best suited to respond to a community's particular needs. Um, or a master plan will assess historical uses of particular areas and evaluate how that fits with future hopes and dreams. Master plans are not always available for guidance and reference, and even sometimes when they are, um, they do need to be regularly updated um, and also taken with a grain of salt, of course, as no one person or indeed no one team can possibly take all concerns into consideration or know what changes uh, the future may bring. Um, what is challenging is making sure that the master plans are actually paid attention to once they're done. So often they're completed and paid for and then shelved and, um, and not referred to again when, when policies and programs are uh, moving forward. So normally the way that a public art project begins is with the convening of a review committee. This committee may be made up of agency employees, arts professionals, community members, and anyone else in the, uh, that the commissioning body would like to include in the review and approval process. It's important here to take into consideration any conflict of interest issues that may, may arise, although of course in smaller communities, conflict of, issue, a conflict of interest issues may be impossible to avoid. Um, for instance, in some communities, <clears throat> Uh, the options for arts professionals to be included on a committee are somewhat limited, and so a gallery owner may be asked to participate, which isn't necessarily bad. It just raises the concern that if any of the artists under consideration for a commission are represented by the gallery, um, the gallery owner may have a financial interest in the outcome and obviously complicate that voting process. In general, it's always a good idea to be sensitive to potential conflicts uh, or the appearance and to try to structure a decision-making process accordingly. The role of the committee is to fairly assess potential artist candidates and determine which of the candidates has the best potential to create a work that reflects the uh, community's artistic, cultural, and other goals as determined by what the committee or commissioning body has determined will be the criteria for, again, our um, nebulous word, success. Um, I, I will say that you know there, there's there's this ongoing debate as to whether uh, the most important criteria for success involves um, uh, the curation of good art or elevated art, or whether it's something that should be more driven by community desires. And, and that is a debate that continues and will continue into the future and should continue. And of course, it depends from uh, moment to moment and project to project what's more um, important to consider. Recently, a colleague who I respect tremendously, and I respect her, her um, curatorial abilities uh, tremendously, told me a story about how she convened an artist selection panel for a mural um, that was intended to honor a young man who had been murdered. Um, obviously a very emotional situation, 
And uh, she was particularly unimpressed by one of the artworks presented by uh, an artist. But the presentation proved to be so moving um, that uh, the committee selected that work. And my colleague conceded that it was often not her job to impose her artistic values on the community, um, but instead to um, pay attention to what moves the community and is important to the community. So not everyone agrees with taking this position, but really it is important to consider whether the goal is to create something the community wants or to curate an art collection that will win the approval of art critics. And again, that's always going to be a debate. Uh, ultimately, the artist selected through the um, selection process will work with a project manager. Hopefully there will be a project manager uh, who could be a part of the team within um, a public art department or could be uh, a part of another agency like building or culture, buildings or cultural affairs or tourism. Um, and the project manager may or may not have an art background, be familiar with um, contracts or have much experience at all. So, these are things to look for in terms of um, who has been assigned the, the task of managing the project once it's been selected. Hopefully, however, the project manager will at least be someone who's organized and interested enough in the project to pay attention and ask the right questions along the way and make sure that the project stays on track. Uh, in contrast, and by the way, this is not to say that project managers within the public art context um, within a, a governmental agency are not competent. There are many extremely competent project managers, but there are also uh, not so competent project managers, and that can really impact um, how a project goes and, again, ultimately the success of that project. In contrast, in private development situations, there will likely not be a committee, but there may be a person or people within the developer's team designated to be in charge of the art project process. Uh, whatever project the developer wishes to pursue will likely have to go through some city or municipal approval process as well, but it'll be different from that public process that engages uh, a large, larger contingent uh, of community members. Often at this stage, uh, with private development, it's advisable for the developer to engage the services of a public art consultant uh, who can act as liaison between the developer and the city um, and the artist. The art consultant essentially acts as a project manager for that public art project, uh, and, the public, uh, and the art consultant um, can also select the artist or artist for consideration and help shape that project in a way that suits the developer while staying within the boundaries that will result in a project suitable for approval by the city. So that public art consultant should be somebody who understands uh, the approval process on the government side, as well as the goals of the developer on the private side. Um, it really is a tremendous benefit to have an experienced art consultant um, who can be familiar with, with both sides, as well as understanding the way in which artists work, which we all know um, can be challenging as well as very rewarding. So uh, the, the tricky part here is making sure that that public art um, consultant is not representing to the artist that they are representing the artist's interests when in fact they're representing the developer's interests or any other um, uh, different arrangement of that uh, responsibility. If they're being paid by the developer, ultimately they answer to the developer. Something to note here as well is that oftentimes communities will provide developers with an option to pay a fee in lieu of managing their own art project. So generally this money um, would be paid into an account that can be used uh, for public art in other municipal venues or to fund other aspects of a city's cultural policy. This can be a way for a community to build up some reserves to take care of administration of public art collections, um, to fund maintenance and conservation responsibilities, and to do other things that the general allocation to the public art um, uh, programs might not otherwise cover. However, the downside of this in lieu option is that the goal of the community is to ensure that private development, well, I suppose if the goal of the community, we have to get there first, but if the goal of the community is to ensure that private development integrates aesthetic elements into a project, allowing the developer to pay a fee instead may leave a community with unattractive unattractive development um, and the problem of how to make it look better is then left up to the municipality. Um, of course, there are many ways that developers can create appealing projects without integrating artwork by using talented landscapers, um, lighting designers, or other architectural elements, but it is up to the municipality to determine how much to regulate that kind of development in general. 
um, and how development is regulated will have a lot to do with the larger urban growth plan and the desire to attract or repel certain types of new development. Okay, at the outset of the planning process, um, the decision makers need to define what the parameters of the project will be. They need to articulate the purpose and expectations for the project and discuss any considerations that need to be kept in mind during the selection and planning phase. Considerations might include, um, and you'll see the pictures illustrating them here, location of the work, content of the work, um, is the work to address or respond to a particular subject, a memorial or a location, uh, third, uh, the size and scope of the work. Will it include movable parts, technology, water features? Number four, what conditions need to be taken into consideration in the choice of materials if it's outside? Are there particular weather conditions such as rain, snow, heat, sun, um, or geographic or environmental conditions like salty sea air, uh, excessive pollution, or hard or soft terrain? And then, um, course number five what is the budget and finally six what is the time frame for completion so um, when the the process is um, being put together these considerations will help inform how the artwork is selected um, it's also possible that an already existing artwork could be purchased directly from an artist or gallery so um, it, these same considerations of course would have to be um, in place in order to determine whether uh, a, a pre-existing artwork would be an appropriate purchase. Most often, however, the commissioning body is interested in having something unique and custom for a community, and thus it is necessary to select an artist or group of artists to submit concepts or proposals. Uh, and so our next step would be, how do the artists find out about such opportunities and apply for consideration? The selection of an artist might happen pursuant to an invitation, um, especially if we're talking about uh, private development. But from the public side, if the decision makers have a particular um, uh, process that they need to go through, the most common practice for, um, uh, public pro for public artworks is that they would be publicized through an RFP or an RFQ. Um, an RFQ, as I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know, is a request for qualifications. And when an RFQ is issued, artists are invited to submit their qualifications indicating um, that they have experience and um, the ability to, um, to um, uh, propose and complete such a project. Um, they are indicating that they're qualified for consideration, generally based on previous work experience. Um, and then based on submissions, several artists will be selected and generally either interviewed before a final selection is made or paid a, uh, a small fee, usually a few hundred to maybe a, a couple thousand dollars, to submit a proposal containing ideas for the art project. If a proposal is submitted, then the final selection will be based on the review of the proposal. And either way, the artist gets to keep that proposal fee, whether they get the project or not. And the nice thing about this process is that it generally provides for some compensation to the artist for the work that they put in, whether or not they are selected. Um, you can also generally, um, you, you also are generally gonna have a more reliable selection pool as those applying will have had some experience to back up their proposals. And you'll know that they've had successful projects uh, in the past. And in this case, successful being, you know, things like on budget and on time. An RFP on the other hand, or a request for proposal, is a much more complex and time-consuming process, but can be also very positive. If a selection committee sends out an RFP, they expect to get back concrete ideas for a particular project. This can require knowledge of the site if the work is site-specific, um, and often too, the RFP will ask for some initial budgetary information to see if the proposal is within the budgetary parameters of the project. While the RFP will yield some interesting results and it's fun to see all the proposed ideas, it's not a very effective way of determining the financial feasibility of a project as the proposal is generally so preliminary and there are so many factors that arise along the way that it can be um, a misleading or complicating factor uh, in the RFP process. An additional downside of RFPs from the artist perspective is that they're generally being asked uh, to essentially work for free. For artists and public artists in particular, concepts are their work, so having to give it up for free can be very frustrating. Also, there's further risk that those selecting the artwork um, and the artist 
uh, will like a co concept but wish to have another artist execute it. And this creates all sorts of ethical problems um, that I have seen gone awry in too many situations. Um, so people need to be very conscious of that if they're gonna employ the RFP process. There is, however, a big benefit to the RFPs. And that is that um, artists without previous work experience actually have a shot at projects. So it can be a really great way to showcase new and potentially fresh ideas for a project. Uh, and emerging artists can wow a committee into giving them a chance at a project for which they might otherwise not have qualified. So bottom line, RFQs will get quickly to your most experienced artists and the ones likely to deliver a reliable product on time and on budget. And RFPs provide a better opportunity for emerging and less experienced public artists to have a shot at projects by presenting fresh and exciting concepts. It needs to be clear that at all times when materials are submitted during the selection process, they should be considered the property of the artist submitting. Um, and again, this goes back to what I was mentioning just a minute ago, um, where there's a request as part of the selection process for an artist to um, present work that then uh, the committee wants another artist to uh, incorporate into their proposal. Um, sometimes artists are even asked to waive copyrights as a, as a requirement to submit um, their proposals, whether it's for qualifications or proposals. And this is just a really inappropriate and um, bad practice and should not be part of the discussion until the artist is actually selected. Then there often is a conversation that comes up around copyright ownership, um, and that's something that is going to be dependent on the situation, although generally speaking, the best practice in the public art field is for the artist to always maintain that copyright. In any event, the selection process may include several meetings of the committee to review and call all the applications. The artist may be back, asked back to interview um, and or come in to present new design concepts or revised design concepts based on site visits or building plans. And then finally, the decision makers will choose an artist and move forward with the actual commissioning phase. Whenever the decision makers do finally choose an artist, controversial or not, um, it is then time to move forward with the actual commissioning phase. The commissioning phase is a great time for a contract, my favorite part of this. Um, some programs will provide a contract that covers the entire process of the project from design to installation, and others will wanna start with a design contract and then move forward a piece at a time to fabrication and installation only once there's approval of the design. Initially, the winning design may be conceptual, but very quickly needs to solidify into a design plan that can be memorialized in a written agreement and submitted to the appropriate parties for approval. Once the design is relatively solid, everyone can pretty much agree on the scope of what the final deliverable will look like. And of course, that scope can change and generally does change at some point um, along the way, but all parties must be prepared for that and, and maintain some flexibility along the way. Um, if it changes too dramatically, however, and there will be increased costs or adjustments to the schedule that will need to be made, that's the sort of thing that needs to be renegotiated. Clear language in a contract is imperative to thoroughly address all of these complexities and provide enough flexibility to absorb the inevitable challenges and changes that accompany every project. Uh, contracts for commissions will generally range from 15 to 25 pages. Um, I, I, anything much longer than that, and there's probably language that doesn't need to be there. However, I will say that when we're talking about projects that are uh, being done pursuant to a larger general contract for, for construction, there may be thousands of pages um, that are referred to. And so it's very important from the standpoint of working on the public art side of it um, to understand what parts of that much larger contract are going to be um, uh, pertinent to the public art project itself, um, and hopefully there's not the need to pay a lawyer to read the entire thousands of pages that everybody else is um, uh, working pursuant to. Um, okay, so while we don't have time to go through everything in granular detail today, in fact, I think I'm technically out of time. I'm just going to try to wrap it up here quickly. Um, I will touch on a few of the important contract-related highlights. So budget. Budget is, of course, super important and uh, can be the nexus for many conflicts. Um, what is the budget? Number one, the artist fee should generally be around 20%. 
This fee should be protected and the artist should not be asked to discount that. That said, it, it sometimes has to be a little bit flexible. Number two, fabrication costs are not just the cost of having the artwork produced, but can also include architects, 3D drafting, engineering, and other related professional services. And these costs can be substantial. Inexperienced artists won't, won't know this necessarily going into it, and it can cause problems and eat into that artist fee. So it's very important that um, that's something that is considered up front. Number three, um, site preparation responsibilities must clearly be set out in the agreement. Generally, especially when there are other construction uh, projects happening, the owner is responsible for site preparation. But good communication is required to ensure that any necessary utilities are brought to the site, potential weight load is properly calculated um, for foundational work, and all ADA requirements are closely followed. This should be part of a conversation that's happening amongst all the parties involved. Um, we'll talk briefly about installation in a moment, but a few expectations, uh, but with, I'm sorry, but with a few exceptions. Installation should be done by licensed and bonded contractors to protect everyone. Um, I will sometimes see that artists are asked to do installation and it's just not a great idea in terms of trying to save money um, because you're opening up a whole new category of potential liability. Um, so I generally put that in the foolish and short-sighted category. That said, oftentimes artists are very knowledgeable about the installation process that pertains to their work, and so having them there as supervising um, or uh, communicating with the installers can be very crucial to that project being installed properly. Um, and, and finally here, contingencies are always a good idea if not required in order to allow wiggle room for the inevitable changes and surprises that come up along the way. It's also a wise policy for the commissioning body to hold back a bit of their own contingency um, so I like to see that there's a contingency in the budget of usually 10 to 20 percent, um, but there may be additionally on the side of the commissioning party uh, another small contingency just in case. What is the schedule for the project? Another big topic in, um, in the contract uh, negotiations and, and documents themselves. Commissioning parties need to be um, very clear and understand the way in which a uh, fabrication schedule will, will roll out so that they can execute a contract and request any changes in a timely manner and know how this is going to impact uh, potentially delivery of the project down the road. This can be particularly important if the work um, is being commissioned in conjunction with new construction. Any of you who have ever done construction know that it's rarely completed on time or on the original uh, schedule or budget. Um, and understanding how a project fits within a larger scheduled project can be crucial to the success of getting that artwork installed on time and on budget. Additionally, it can be <clears throat> um, a crucial consideration at this point as the artist needs to get fabrication services lined up. Fabricators generally have a schedule of their own to adhere to, and if one project gets bumped, it may be months before that fabricator can accommodate it again. So it's not always just a question of bumping it a couple weeks here and there, um, there may be other complicating domino effects that come out of that. Okay, documents. Um, while artists are drawing on a great deal of creative talent to create their artwork, they also need to understand at a very precise level how the artwork will be integrated into the site, whether there's uh, new construction or not. Thus, it's really important to determine what documents the artists need in order to design the artwork and the artists may be passing those documents on to engineers and, and other professionals that they're working with in order to prepare um, final design plans and uh, pursue with the uh, for with the with the fabrication. Further, um, it's important to understand what permits or licenses are needed to install the artwork and who is responsible for obtaining these. Artists are generally not in the business of obtaining permits or, or licenses, and so it's a little bit complicated if you lay that on the artist, um, since the commissioning party is uh, either local or has already had to navigate these kinds of construction rules. It is often best for the commissioning party or general contractor to take on the responsibility for permits or other permissions, but the artist may need to provide uh, information along the way to smooth that process and make sure it's done properly. Uh, an important fact to note here is that artists are unable to obtain professional liability insurance for errors and omissions the way that lawyers, doctors, and architects can, um, and landscape designers. 
um, because artists are not licensed and the willingness of insurance companies to cover the safety of an artist's work is really limited. Um, thus, for all parties involved, it really makes sense to make sure that a licensed and bonded architect uh, or engineer or both sign off and stamp any construction documents so that everyone's properly covered. I've just got a couple more slides to go. I see we're at 11.07. Uh, hopefully I can finish up in the next few minutes and we can get to some questions. So hopefully you all are getting your questions ready to go. Um, okay, so fabrication is the next slide. Um, who else will be involved in the project once it moves to the fabrication stage? Uh, in order to arrive at a reasonably realistic budget, unless an artist is doing all of his or her own fabrication, which would be kind of an anomaly and also not possible with some of these really large scale projects, um, there needs to be an estimate from fabricators. The commissioning party may or may not want to see the costs that are estimated, um, but they are uh, almost certainly going to be interested in knowing who the artist is choosing to do the fabrication. The quality and reliability of fabricators often dictates the ultimate likelihood uh, of the project being completed successfully as a whole. Um, so fabrication is a process that will of course vary enormously depending on the materials selected for the project um, as well as the artist's process. Um, it's also the first major way in which we see how art projects may be treated differently from other construction projects. Often what will happen in public art projects is that since they are often associated with larger construction plans, the artist will get lumped in with the other subs on the job. This is really inappropriate and it's the job of the public art program or consultant or project manager to work to keep the artist's role separate. Uh, for instance, a regular sub usually won't get paid for work until the work is completed and installed but an artist is gonna need more money at the outset. Generally speaking, a large portion of the overall budget is dedicated to the fabrication process. So the artist may actually need thousands or tens of thousands, a huge portion of the budget up front to get that fabrication started. Um, whether it's purchasing large quantities of marble or buying metal for casting or putting a deposit down with the fabricator. Given the, uh, the crucial role that fabricators play in the process, it's always good practice for there to be a contract between the artist and fabricator. A lot of communities don't bother to educate the artists that are participating in their public art um, projects that this is really something that they should be doing. It's a little bit of a fine line because obviously you're getting into the business practices of the artist, um, but it really is crucial and it's important for programs that are more experienced in um, public art project uh, management to make sure that the artists are informed at least enough to uh, consider having a contract between themselves and the fabricator. Along the way, both the artist and the commissioning body will likely want to see proof of work that's being done if it's being done in a different location. Um, this can come either through site visits or photographic documentation and often serves as a milestone to trigger further contract payments. For years, I've been trying to get my client who produces a lot of his works in Italy to bring me to Italy because really the lawyer needs to be there to verify things, but somehow it hasn't worked out. And of course, now we can't travel. So I'll have to wait on that one. Okay, delivery and installation. Uh, upon completion of the work prior to it being shipped to the site, it's always a good idea for the artist to make sure that the owner is ready to receive the work. Um, often construction projects fall behind and the artist is the last one to hear about it. So delivering a huge heavy work of art to a location not ready for it can be an expensive problem to manage, um, either for the artist or the owner or both. If an artist is assembling uh, all or even part of the work on site, it makes sense to know ahead of time what, um, what is going to go on with the site so that the proper arrangements can be made for personnel and equipment. Oftentimes there are some economies of scale that can be realized at this point. In the event that the site is not ready for installation, the commission agreement should clearly set out who's responsible for storage, demobilization and remobilization costs, as well as any insurance to be extended for additional time um, or additional locations. Finally, many municipalities and agencies have strict rules about who can install works on a job site. This goes back to my comment earlier about artists not being the ones to install the work. Um, union rules might apply, uh, and certainly anyone performing um, the work of a licensed contractor will probably have to be approved, an approved vendor um, to that municipality or agency. And this can be a big frustration for the artists as well. 
um, since they do want to be engaged in the process, but it can also be a big budget buster if it's not properly accounted for. Sometimes those approved vendors are more expensive than other vendors that may be available. Once the work is installed at the site um, and any moving parts are moving properly, the owner should immediately inspect the work to ensure that it's as promised and expected. Um, and that approval should be based on the degree to which the artist has satisfied the terms of the agreement and met the expectations set by the earlier conceptual design and approved design plans. Approval really cannot be based on the owner's subjective satisfaction with the work of art. And that sometimes can create some friction, but it's an important part of the conversation at that um, final approval stage um, if that comes up as a, as a question. As soon as the owner is satisfied, the owner should issue a final approval and it's at this point that final payment on the project is generally due and the artist will transfer title to the project to the owner. I always recommend to artists that they do not transfer their title to the project until they've received that final payment. Um, it really is the last thing that they hold um, in their back pocket if uh, there's some problem in getting that last payment. This may seem like this is where the story ends, but of course, this is only where today's presentation ends. There's an entirely new chapter that awaits post-installation, and we will tackle some of those issues, not next week, sadly, but in January, uh, when we talk about maintenance, conservation, intellectual property concerns, and some current hot topics that are making news headlines. Please join us in January for part two, uh, Maintenance to Mayhem. And in the meantime, if uh, you have questions that we don't get to answer today, you can find me here. And of course, again, the public art in private development database is available at artconvergecommunity.com. Um, my website for the, for the law practice side is artconverge.com. So thank you for being here today. Uh, let's move on to the questions portion. And if we don't have time for everything, please do feel free to, to reach out at your convenience. Uh, and I would be happy to speak with anyone, and certainly now, Christine. Wonderful. <laughs> um, if you could please go back to your very first slide. Okay. And talk about my favorite picture, which is the big blue bear. Oh, that's the second slide. Let's see. Oh, How it's the I second slide. Okay. Right um, through. There were just there were a couple of questions about the big blue bear um, and I yes. sent links to like the Denver Convention Center but if you just want to mention it real quick because I mean it's my favorite and I don't mind looking at it again because it's silly. <laughs> it is it's a great piece and I apologize I realized as I was going through that I didn't properly give credit to each of the artists although they are on the slides but um, uh, yeah this is I see what you mean by Lawrence Argent and Lawrence um, uh, sadly passed away a few years ago, but this was one of his iconic works in Denver. Um, and it is a large bear looking into the window of the convention center. So was there a, a question about it? No, people just wanted to know where it was. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Yeah, again, apologies for not um, calling that out. I felt like I needed to rush through everything because there was so much to cover. No worries. Um, let's jump into some questions. Do you have suggestions for towns that are just starting to create public art programs? So what is step one? Whose buy-in do we need to get first to get things rolling? Uh, talk to us about that. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> I <know>. um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it really depends on the community. You know, it really it really changes from community to community what the appropriate way to deal with um, starting a public art program is. Uh, it's important to know who the stakeholders are. It's important to know who is supportive and where the challenges might be. Um, this is where the, the database for the private development side has been really helpful for people because they can look through uh, other ordinances and programs to see the structure of other programs. Same goes on the public side as well. Um, and that's where organizations like Americans for the Arts Public Art Network um, can be really helpful. There are um, people from all over the country that engage in that. They're mostly public art administrators. And so um, by reaching out and developing that network, you can have access to um, lots of different people who have had tons of experience in all different um, situations. Um, so yes, I would say, Figuring out what the goals are, and that's sort of where I 
why I wanted to start with talking about what is public art um, and then what does success mean. So figuring out what success means for one community is going to be very different from what success means for another community. Um, and in, in having that kind of conversation and figuring out what um, communities need to be served within, within the larger uh, community is important in figuring out um, how you're going to structure a program. It also is going to dictate what kinds of artwork is appropriate to bring in. Uh, and certainly there are different considerations to be made, whether you're talking about um, visual work, performative work, temporary work, permanent work. Um, so all of those considerations need to, to go into it. Um, then just very briefly, um, you know, some communities don't go the route of having an ordinance that requires public art. Um, they'll have a city council resolution or something a little bit um, less formal and, um, and less in the municipal code um, and more uh, a policy that they're putting in place. And depending on, again, what the goals are and why you might go that route um, will determine to some degree the kind of support that's received for the program and the way in which funding can happen. Um, I, I really feel pretty strongly that as much as possible, arts workers and artists and anybody working in the creative sector needs to be valued just as any other part of our government structure is valued. And so I like to see um, formal programs that are um, either within the government structure or um, if it is a nonprofit outside, some, uh, then it needs to be run in a way that, um, that is appropriate for the, the value of, of what public art is bringing to those communities. So that's certainly part of what I do with clients is to um, help them navigate through that process and um, working with them to establish a creative strategy and, and a strategic plan for their specific community based on a lot of different questions, um, some of which we've touched on today. Okay, thank you. Um, how about partnering with uh, local public utilities to locate public art on their property. Do you have any experience with that? Or, um, you know, who do we need to send the cupcakes to? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of communities look to things like painting um, electrical boxes or fire hydrants. And obviously those utilities are managed um, and overseen by different departments. And so, it's going to depend again on what the relationships are, um, but it's important to have public works on board for something like that. Um, it may be something that comes from the community side where um, there's pressure being put on uh, whether it's city council members or um, boards of supervisors or other political bodies that can bring those kinds of questions to um, a decision making uh, process or it can come from inside. It could be a public art program that decides that this is one way that they'd like to um, branch out. Um, so there are certainly many different examples of those kinds of programs, um, and they happen in a lot of different ways. But um, you know, in the end, as with everything, building relationships is the most important thing and understanding who is the decision maker in that kind of a situation and what that project is. You know, It's one thing, um, to locate, say, a plinth on Parks property versus painting a utility box um, that Public Works oversees. So it could be very different people that you have to go to. Um, you should always send the cupcakes to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to depend. But those programs can be, they're considered sort of small programs, but they can be very impactful because it's stuff that people walk by every single day. And I know that there are even um, uh, you know, private organizations like there's um, Beautify Earth in Santa Monica, and they focus on murals, but they're also looking at things like, um, you know, taking that mural um, strategy and applying it to utilities boxes, and how do you get um, the, the, the private nonprofit um, in a position where they can do that on city property, and it can be complicated, but relationships is really the, the answer, and that's going to depend from, from place to place. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question, I, I like to ask it in some form or fashion when we have some kind of public art uh, session. And particularly now, I think um, 
I think we can say that generally the, the public is sensitive right now to a lot of things. Um, and art is sort of sensitive and personal to begin with. Um, we had a session a couple months ago around public art and um, the, um, the speaker put up a picture of a wall mural and it had a hand symbol on it um, that I didn't even know could be derogatory, but apparently to many it, it is as a sign of white supremacy. Um, and the, the community um, around there started to get a little upset as it was starting to come out that this wasn't just a normal hand gesture, that it was something more than that. Mm -hmm. And I know that the, the artist was kind of pushing back saying, you know, no, you can't take this down just because some people find that it's maybe offensive to them, but not to others. And so with that, and I, I like to bring this case locally, I got my graduate degree at Cleveland State in the uh, urban urban affairs department. And there's a big sculpture, sculpture that's been outside of my building for like a decade or two decades. Well, the artist decided to make an edit to it maybe <laughs> two years ago. And I mean, it is it uses words that it shouldn't. <laughs> and um, actually the, the school ended up having to pay the artist $50,000 to move it off campus because he wouldn't take the the derogatory words off of the sculpture that, you know, and he added to it post installation. So I guess I have a two part question. One, what do we do when the community, uh, it, it finds art offensive um, and to what degree do they have the right to feel that it's offensive? Um, so I, I guess that's part one, Let, let's start there because I think particularly now more than ever, everyone is sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're raising questions that we'll dig into a lot more in January um, because maintenance and um, deaccession are definitely big issues. And um, so you, you raised a, a bunch of different questions. Um, the content of, of artwork is going to be driven by um, the policies around it. And so that's where, you know, when you've got sanctioned artwork that puts up an image that is offensive to some, um, sometimes, you know, there has to be uh, a conversation around does it stay up or does it not stay up? Um, and that is going to be a conversation that has to happen on a case by case basis. There has to be some um, conversation as to what part of the community is feeling aggrieved. Um, you know, most art is not going to <clears throat> satisfy everybody all the time. So you're going to have controversies. And in some ways, that's the beauty of the public art is that it, it generates conversations. On the other hand, if it's something that is making um, a substantial portion of people feel uncomfortable um, or is offensive or could be inciting um, bad behavior, then there has to be you know, another um, consideration of public safety and um, uh, other, other things come into play. This is why it's really important to have a, a very specific process that you go through when there are controversies and problems. There has to be a process to allow for <clears throat> the reconsideration of an artwork um, and the, de the potential deaccession of an artwork. And we're seeing a lot of that with, um, certainly with Confederate monuments issues, but also um, with a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, unsanctioned work and sanctioned work that's going up around Black Lives Matter, uh, which is a, a very interesting question. If you're going to allow as a community Black Lives Matter um, murals and artwork, do you not also have to allow Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and any number of other um, interest groups that want to put up you know, what they believe in? And so that's where we get into those tricky First Amendment issues. And we will definitely talk about um, deaccession considerations next time. Um, the other issue that you brought up is, um, um, I guess, a maintenance issue, but just because an artist is the one who's coming back and editing their work or um, augmenting their work in some way doesn't mean that it's okay. Um, that work does belong to whoever commissioned it. Again, the title belongs to them. Um, there may be some ongoing moral rights for the artist to be engaged in any repair or restoration work, 
but the artist does not have the right in the United States to go and change their work after the fact. Europe is another story. There are moral rights in Europe <clears throat> that don't apply here. Um, but in general, the artist is going to be uh, just as liable as anyone else for going and um, augmenting their work after the fact. I hope that touched on a couple of things that you yep. raised. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, are you aware of a collection of resources um, digitally for localities to uh, that are looking to create a public art program, either you know best practices or policy advice? Um, where can we find a good collection? So um, Americans for the Arts uh, does a public art in review process every year, which highlights um, based on uh, the panel of jurors for that year, it highlights a certain number of works every year. So there's an archive on the Americans for the Arts Public Art Network website. Um, I, you might have to be a member in order to access it, but it's not a, it's not a large fee if you do. And that's an excellent resource for going and getting some visual ideas um, around what's going on in the country and what kind of works um, are being created. Um, so from a visual standpoint, that database is great. <clears throat> when I was on the Public Art Network Council, um, my main uh, drive, like the, the, the project, my, my project um, that I worked on with the rest of the council was to develop um, a series of best practices. And so that is also available. I can, um, Christine, I can send you the link for that. Maybe you can disseminate that. Um, so there is a list of like 30 best practices that programs really need to take into consideration. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of other resources, um, I know that AFTA is building out their public art resources site. I'm not sure what information at this point is on there. Um, and then there's the, the database that I maintain. So, um, you know, it, a, a lot of the a lot of the work that goes into these programs is something that happens um, over time and, and based on those relationships and based on reaching out to people and asking how and why they do things a certain way. Um, and that is a great deal of what I do in my practice is to work with communities to help develop those programs and, and bring those relationships to the table so that we can reach out and get the best resources possible. There are also art consultants um, who work in, in this area as well. You know, they may not be lawyers, uh, but they're very knowledgeable about uh, the structure of public art programs, and they may be the people who are putting together the master plans, and so also have a, a great deal of understanding as to the relationship between the arts and the um, community process. And so um, there are a number of consultants around the country who have excellent reputations in doing that kind of work. I hope that's helpful as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we, we, there are a ton of questions that we obviously can't go to because it's time to wrap up. Um, how can people get a hold of you? How do you want them to, to message you? That is the last slide. Whoops, for some reason it's not. Huh. Oh, not I, bad. The last no, minute is when we have no, the technology it, issue. <laughs> that's okay. It's me getting confused between my laptop and my desktop. Okay. So I'll go to the last slide here. While she's forwarding through, we are recording the session. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. We'll also have these slides available as a PDF on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And you can get a hold of Sarah at the information on your screen. Great. Wonderful. Well, Sarah, thank you for joining us. We are so thrilled that we were able to, to get this rescheduled and we look forward to seeing you again in January. And thank you to the Urban Design and Preservation Division for hosting this and the next session. Uh, everyone, hey, have a great weekend and we will talk next time. Bye-bye.